brought to you by the Naked Scientists, the Cambridge Science Festival podcast. Hello and welcome to the final Cambridge Science Festival podcast with me, Mira Senthilingam from thenakedscientists.com. Coming up, we find out what happens in our brains in the face of danger, have a lesson on the basics of cosmology and find out what happens to us when we see disturbing images. All that coming up on today's Cambridge Science Festival podcast. But first, the National Trust maintain and develop some of the most beautiful parts of the English countryside, with ambitious plans to protect and conserve country houses, forests, beaches, castles and even archaeological remains. One of their big schemes is the Wiccan Fen Project, a plan to grow and develop one of the most important wetlands in Europe. Ben met up with Stuart Warrington from the National Trust to find out more about the project. The Wigan Fen Project is a long-term exciting plan to make one of our most iconic and famous nature reserves in England, Wigan Fen, much, much bigger. Not just sort of a small pocket, but a really huge landscape. This sounds like a really, really long-term plan. These things take a long time to mature. When are you expecting this to be done? We're taking a long-term view about this. We set a, a vision for 100 years to complete the, the project because we've got no powers of compulsory purchase. We can't tell farmers to sell their land to us because we want to make it into a nature reserve. We just have to wait and see if a farmer decides he's had enough farming and is happy to see it turn into a nature reserve then we'll be interested in trying to buy it from him if we can raise the money. The idea of taking 100 years is simply that um, we also don't know how long it takes to recreate the Fenland habitats that used to be out there north of Cambridge all the way up to the, to the wash. It could take 50 years, it could take 100 years to recreate the sort of peats from which these wonderful species-rich wildlife reserves used to be before they all got farmed. And I believe that it's not just being done to encourage the species that used to be there, the various different plants and animals, but also there's a more ecological climate change-based idea behind it. Absolutely right. The first principle was that the reserve was too small to keep all its special species there forever. I mean, we've actually recorded 7,900 species, which for a British nature reserve is actually an amazing number. It probably isn't much for a tropical rainforest, but it's really good for Britain. But you can't get it more going on a postage stamp nature reserve. So you need a bigger nature reserve. So that's the first point. The other ones is that if you want to give um, species a chance to respond to climate change, they're going to need space to move. So... If you can make a big area for wildlife, then even within it you'll get different conditions and then species will be able to respond as one area dries out and another area gets wetter. So species can move to where what suits them best. And that's only really possible if you've got a big nature reserve. The other thing about the climate change question is that with sea level rise, we're going to lose wetlands around the coast of Britain. Sea level predicted to rise 50 centimetres, maybe a metre, over the next century. So we're going to lose all those freshwater marshes that are trapped along the coastline. And if we can make a big freshwater wetland inland, there's somewhere for the species from the coast to come as well. Well, again, other than the biodiversity, are there any advantages to us as humans to having wetlands around? There certainly are. Firstly, there's sort of just the access to an exciting wild place rather than sort of a manicured park. This is going to be a much wilder place with places where the, um, the animals are there all year round, big grazing animals, horses, cattle, roe deer, um, rabbits, of course, all those sort of things. So somewhere for people to go and really escape from our rather crowded modern life. The other thing is that a big area is much more able to function as an ecosystem and do the things that ecosystems have always done for us. And we sort of take for granted the fact that the microbiology in a, a wetland nature reserve helps to purify the water, the fact that a big nature reserve that's wet will help to accumulate carbon and start to set carbon back into peat rather than all disappearing. So maybe help a little tiny bit with, with our sort of excess carbon in the atmosphere and climate change. And probably the, the final thing about these big areas is they give you a bit of a buffer. If the River Cam is in flood, we'll have a big wetland that can receive water. It'll be able to respond much more flexibly than a little nature reserve would be. And so surely the plan isn't just to buy up the land around it and flood it? No, not at all. It is like a big basin or a saucer, and so you will get the wettest in the low-lying areas, and it'll grade from maybe some shallow pools, reed beds, you know, with the tall reeds fringed on the side, into wet grassland, which then dries out in the summer. And on the edges, where you come up onto different soils, there's some chalky soils and gravelly soils, you'll get dry grassland, classic countryside of scattered trees, ponds and so on. Well, it sounds like a fantastic place for schoolchildren to go now and then go again in their retirement. 
Well, probably I think all of us should have to keep an eye on it and see how it develops. Because in the 10 years or so since the vision was launched, we've more than doubled the size of the nature reserve already. And it also changes quite dramatically through the seasons. In the winter now, it's still rather straw-coloured and a bit bleak on a cold day like today. But in the summertime, it's uh, full of dragonflies, full of birds, full of flowers. So it's a place that's worth keeping an eye on, I think. That was Stuart Warrington from the National Trust, with some very good reasons to visit the Wickenfen National Nature Reserve. But no need to rush. The reserve will be developing for the next hundred years. Now, have you ever wondered what goes on in our minds in the face of danger? Or just how our brains manage to remember so much? Well, the MRC's Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit opened its doors to the festival on Tuesday to help visitors understand the processes that take place in our brains when we learn, see images, learn languages or also what happens in our brains to cause Parkinson's disease. In fact, Laura Hughes from the MRC gave a lecture not only about what causes Parkinson's disease, but about research showing that the medication used on Parkinson's patients may not have as good an effect on the brain as they thought. I'll be talking about a research study that we did last year on Parkinson's disease. Particularly, we're looking at the effects of medication on um, cognition in patients. So what is the medication that they're on? A lot of patients are taking L-DOPA, which is a dopamine replacement. The primary cause of the symptoms in Parkinson's disease is due to a loss of dopamine. It's a neurotransmitter in the motor system. So the L-DOPA just essentially replaces or helps to replace that dopamine. And so what did the study involve? Uh, We had about 20 patients and they came here to the unit on two different occasions, once on their medications and once off their medications. And we asked them to have a brain scan at the MRI unit. And whilst they were having their brain scan, we asked them to do a little task in which we could look at a measure of their cognitive abilities. What was the task? The task involved the patients looking at a series of letters presented on the screen and they were asked to detect either an A followed by an X or they were asked to detect any letter appearing at 6 o'clock followed by 3 o'clock. So it's actually a verbal versus a spatial task, so there were those two elements to the task. Then whilst they were having their scan, we could look at their brain activity involved with doing these two different types of tasks. What was found? Essentially what we found was that medications didn't have the effects that we expected. Actually, when patients were on their medication, it did improve the motor symptoms. I mean, Parkinson's disease is a very... It is a motor disease, and the primary symptoms are very kind of very slow, difficult, stiff movements. And obviously medication will always improve these, and so patients can respond faster and be more accurate whilst they're doing the task. But other than that, we didn't actually see our predicted effect on cognition. We expected them to maybe perform worse and more errors or slower reaction times when they were off their medication. Actually, we didn't see that. What can you do in the future? I think that in combination with the medications, it's quite important for patients to realise that although medications might be um, helping them improve their motor abilities, they might actually have a more negative effect on their cognitive abilities and this is something that they may experience as the disease progresses. You have to prioritise, it's your own lifestyle, it's what you want to get out of life and they need to kind of just think it through. So patients who are working and who may be more reliant on having their uh, cognitive abilities intact may prefer to take lower doses of medications. For the first hour of the event, there's a room filled with various activities that visitors can do. I'm here with Emma, who's hosting the Emotional Images and Their Effect on Your Cognitions area. Hello, Emma. Hello. So what are visitors going to have to do in this section? Basically, this is a computer-based task where um, you have three pictures presented in the middle of the screen and you have to look at the two outer ones and decide whether they're the same or different from each other. The catch is there will be some particularly unpleasant images in the middle. It could be of crime scenes, of violence, of horrible snakes or something. And we've actually found that these images, if they're particularly high in impact, then they have more of an effect on your cognition, so it slows you down in your reaction time. At the end, we'll also ask them to write down any images from the middle that they can remember, and this is um, quite interesting as well, because often the images will be of high-impact sort rather than the low-impact or the neutral ones. 
and that, that's what we're looking into. And hopefully these kind of studies will give us more of an idea into why emotion affects you and therefore can help with emotional disorders. Okay, so I'm here with Robert, who's just come off the emotional images activity. Hello, Robert. Hello. So what did you have to do on that? OK, I had to go through a set of images. There were two images that I had to tell the difference, whether they well, whether they're the same or different. And there was an image in the middle that was either sort of fairly mundane or fairly extreme. So which ones did you remember? Um, there was one on a Ku Klux Klan and um, the car crash that I remember. And the, uh, there was also one on the cathedral, but that wasn't particularly high impact. But <laughs> so another activity here today is about structure and memory. I'm here with Sean, who's manning this particular activity. Hello, Sean. Hello. What do people have to do here? It's assessing how well people can remember spatial scenes. So what people will do is they'll see four rows of four squares and they'll have to remember squares that light up in a given car- target colour. So we're investigated exactly why people are, can remember or have a superior performance on certain tasks than others. So we found that if there's a structure in the squares that light up in the target colour, for example, they see an N or they see some sort of bigger structure, then it's easier to remember than if they're just random. That's the main point, but we're also looking at the effect of irrelevant information. So in life, we don't just have to remember one thing, but we have to remember several things. And we have to ignore irrelevant things which show up. So it's assessing how well people can have this sort of top-down modulation of attention so that they prioritise relevant environmental stimuli and the effect this has on their ability to remember things. People's performance is worse when they have to ignore irrelevant information and when the span is structured, they seem to have better performance. So the key to good memory is to structure the information you're trying to get into your head. Another speaker at the event was Dean Mobbs, also from the MRC, who discussed the processes taking place in our brains when we're faced with danger. I caught him beforehand to ask him more. Tonight I'll be talking about um, different levels of fear, which basically the relationship between when fear is near versus when fear is far away, and this seems to um, evoke different parts of the brain. A good example is if a bear is 50 feet away from you compared to if a bear was 5 feet away from you. Although you're not directly being attacked by the thing at the time, different brain systems would come online preparing you for the attack. So one would imagine that, based upon the research, that when a bear was, say, 50 feet away, we would start to plan to try and avoid the bear. But as it got closer, we would shift to more primitive regions, fight, flight, freezing behave regions that are in a region known as the midbrain, or particularly a region known as the periaqueductal grey. And this region is more associated with panic disorder, whereas these more prefrontal regions are associated with further distance and more associated with um, anxiety. OK, and so now you know that these different regions are affected, um, what, do you, what do you plan to kind of do with this information? What we're basically about is trying to understand how these systems interact with each other. And until um, recently, it was not really known if these regions are associated with distance and intensity of fear. There was a switch between these more anxiety regions to panic regions. The implications of that to the future are still a little bit unclear, though. So I guess the best way to get out of a situation is just to keep the bear further away. Run away from it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was Dean Mobbs from the MRC Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit. Unravelling the Cambridge Science Festival. The Naked Scientists online at thenakedscientist.com. And now it's time for today's festive question. I'm David Golding and I'm interested in the effectiveness of subliminal messages. And here's the director of the MRC's Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit, William Marsden-Wilson, attempting the answer. It's not clear that they do work. The effects that you do see are very small, and it's very unlikely that the subliminal world, unless unless you're actually aware of it, will have a real effect on your behaviour or emotions. So people have done experiments in in the brain scanner where they look at the brain response to a word depending on whether you, you can see it or not. And what you can actually see in terms of how different parts of the brain respond is that there is a response to a word that you're not aware of, but it's a very small response. If it's a word that you actually see or hear and you're aware of hearing, then you get a much larger response. And it also looks, looking at brain response, that the effects of the word meaning, the emotional content of the word, which might be what people are trying to get at when they give you a subliminal message, is weak to non-existent. So if a message really is subliminal, you really don't see it, it probably doesn't work very well. So we're not as easily tricked as advertisers think we are. During the festival, the Institute for Astronomy also held events, taking on some big topics. And by big, I mean as in Big Bang. 
we sent Ben Valzer along to Adrian Leonard's talk on cosmology for beginners. So let's begin at the beginning. Just what is cosmology? Well, cosmology is basically the science of everything that exists, so the universe as a whole, from its smaller scales to its bigger scales, and how it evolved from what it was at the beginning, which was essentially nothing, uh, through the Big Bang to how we form structures today. Cosmology is a very big subject, so how do you fit it all into a 45-minute talk? Um, you take a lot of shortcuts. Um, th- there's a number of things that I mention in the talk that I don't go into in particularly great detail. There are lots of details and mathematical things that members of the public generally just don't want to know about, so you get to skip over all of that. And I'm just trying to give a basic overview of what the science is and how we think the universe evolved. Do you find people have a problem grasping the scale that you're talking about? Because a lot of people don't even understand what a light year is, so when we're talking the huge distances involved, do people find that difficult? Generally, yes. People are always surprised at how big things are. I mean, when you tell them that there are something like 80 billion galaxies in the universe, people are always surprised by that. And yes, it is a difficult concept to grasp. It took me a while to grasp it as well. But it's a very interesting topic, and I think there's a big thirst for it. Do you find that people are really keen to learn? Very much so, particularly about cosmology, because we're going through sort of a golden age in cosmology at the moment. We've got really good telescopes up there that can do these large surveys of of the universe across all different kinds of wavelengths, and so there's been a really big boom in what we can do in cosmology. And so there's a lot of information out there, and there's been a lot of recent information in the media as well and you know popular science magazines about cosmology so it's something that people are really interested in. So what do you think is the hottest topic in cosmology now? It depends on if you're talking about from the perspective of the public or from the perspective of scientists I think definitely for scientists determining the nature of dark energy and dark matter to a lesser extent I think dark energy is a bigger topic at the moment and thinking about inflation so what happened in the very early universe was the universe underwent this exponential expansion and we don't know what caused it we just think that we know that it happened and so that's a big area of research at the moment. Does the Cambridge Science Festival offer you more opportunities to engage with people? Oh, definitely. We've had a number of open events. Last Saturday we had an open day here where we had probably about a 1,000 people come through and there were a number of different activities. There were lots of astronomers on hand to tell you about all kinds of different work that they're doing. Um, There was a planet factory where kids could go and and build their own planets. And we also had a planet workshop the following day on the Sunday, which is sort of a fusion of, of art and science. So there were some talks about the different planets and then parents and children got to go out and use different artistic materials, make their own planets or their own artistic representations of the planets. The Institute of Astronomy also offer a fantastic opportunity to get a proper glimpse of the cosmos. And this is because you can go along to one of their open observations. Now, this way you'll be able to use a telescope to look at the night sky. I asked Carolyn Crawford what you might expect to see. Well, if you came along tonight and the clouds are clear, there's quite a lot that we can see. There's the beautiful constellation of Orion that's high in the south in the minute, and just above that there's the planet Mars, which you can tell because it's just got that ever so slightly red look about it, and it doesn't twinkle as much as the stars. So you can see Mars high in the south at the minute. And then if you turn to the east in the early evening, you can see Saturn it's a sort of yellowy gold colour and it's one of, it's, it'll be the brightest thing down in the, the eastern sky. And are these the sort of things that people could see at home with amateur equipment? Well, you can see Mars and Saturn without any equipment, really, whether you see them with the naked eye. But they're worth, certainly Saturn's worth looking at. Even if you've got a pair of bird-watching binoculars or a small telescope, you should be able to see the rings around Saturn. Even if you can't see them clearly, you always get the sense that there's, it's slightly extended and there's something just a bit different about it. And the equipment that you use here, will that enable you to see things much clearer? Well, we've got several telescopes we use here for the open evenings. We have two historical telescopes on site which we open up. One dates from 1838 and one from the 1850s. But we also set up a couple of modern telescopes on the lawns with a projection screen. So you get the best of both worlds. You get to see the old telescopes and also see the modern ones in action. And you can see a lot more detail through these. If you look at Saturn, for example, you could see the rings and some of the brighter moons around it. And do you find that something like the Cambridge Science Festival offers you uh, extra opportunities to speak to the public? 
Oh, the enthusiasm we get at any astronomy event and science festival is, is, is brilliant. And there's a whole new audience every week coming along. We run our open evenings from mid-October through all the winter through to mid-March. And it's still wonderful that even in March, the science festival brings a whole new audience along to our public observing. That was Caroline Crawford telling Ben what you could see in the night sky during the festival, provided the clouds cleared. And before that, Adrian Leonard's Beginner's Guide to Cosmology. That's it for today's podcast and for the Cambridge Science Festival 2008. I hope you've enjoyed listening to our coverage of the numerous events that took place over the last 10 days. I'm Mira Senthilingam and this edition of the Cambridge Science Festival podcast was produced by thenakedscientists.com. Thank you.